tonight um, is special in that uh, I'm standing on the grounds where uh, Bishop Verga first came in 1831 to your parish and he became the pastor here and he was a spiritual great. He is venerable right now. He's on his way to being uh, blessed and canonized as canonization as I hope he is. And then you had two other priests that were your pastors that were just shining examples of what true Christian Catholic priests should be that looked out for Native American interest with Bishop Berga and also the white the whites in the area was Father Philip Zorn and Father Nicholas Sifrath, both uh, of your diocese just before the Franciscans came in late 1884-85 is when they came and you guys should be so proud of these three men that were just exemplary uh, examples of what a Christian priest should be helping people and they did so your your parish I'm from Batasi so I'm from St. Francis Xavier which oversees St. Francis Slanus your parish when the Franci especially when the Franciscans came you became kind of the hub of Catholic activity because this parish oversaw so many other parishes. And so fa Father, well, in the, Bishop Berga, he becomes ordained bishop in 1853, and then his two seminarians that we just talked about, Father Sifrath and Father Zorn, he ordains here at this church here. And he puts Father Sifrath in charge of building St. Francis Solanus in 1859. The church uh, you see right there. And so it, what a great, great priest to put in charge. My name is Jeff Haven. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you, Father, for the gracious introduction and prayer. Um, as Joe eloquently put, um, you know, St. Francis Solanus is it's important for many reasons. One, it was the it was the the first Native American church, Catholic church, on our side of the bay. That was, uh, and it's the picture that you see is pretty much how it looks today, and it is the oldest still standing building in Emmett County. This is the original church. If you go there today, the pictures you see is exactly how it was in 1859. There's been numerous re uh, renovations, some we'll touch on during the presentation. Um, and we also have some books over there that the committee, we, um, we spent a lot of time going through a lot of archives trying to get the true historical accuracy of the origination of the church. And we are very, very blessed that the church still standing today has the original windows, most of the original siding. Um, the last restoration that took place started in 2005. Um, I'd like to also um, a warm welcome to Michelle LeCount. Her father, Don Portman, was um, instrumental not only in the Native American community, but also in the Catholic community, and was one of the uh, main chairmen helping with the authentic and representation of the Native American input during the last renovation. Um, and one of the things we talk at great length in the book about, we'll touch on now, is um, I am a Johnny come lately. Uh, the church was completely restored the last time before I got involved, and I helped with a lot of the uh, documentation to help write the book and help Joe with presentations. But um, it's crucial um, to know that as we go through this, that the church was built in 1859, and it still stands. This is an incredible beacon to our Catholic faith in this area. And um, so the re last restoration could not have taken place with a lot of wonderful uh, Catholic families and Michelle's family in the Native American community. It was a truly cooperative effort because there were so many entities that had to be involved. And if you've never been there, there's, um, it, is a, it is a Native American burial ground still. Um, there's not any historical uh, record of who was buried there, unfortunately. A lot of that information is lost. There's representative crosses in the graveyard. Um, but it is a known burial ground. So 
uh, the Odawa community was a, heavily involved with the St. Francis uh, Solanus Committee to really make sure everything was done appropriately and authentically during the last restoration, renovation. And it, it's important to notice there's a difference between restoration and renovation, and I think the committee came up with the right choice to restore the church to as, as much authentic, uh, authentically as possible. So, uh, <clears throat> I want to focus a little on the first, next three pages on the true history of how it started. So, um, uh, this is actually a, the uh, land grant signed by President Franklin Pierce on August 1st, 1853, officially transferring ownership of the property where the church is, all the way down probably towards Magnus Park area to Jean-Baptiste Trotichaud and his heirs. It was uh, 35 and 21 hundredths of an acre, of which one acre was sold to Bishop Berger in 1859. And the Trotoshods uh, purchased the land from an Odawa named Amoe in 1851. And the, uh, again, this is a copy of the original land deed. Um, so July 13th, 1859, uh, this actually is the pages that detail the land sale to the, uh, it's misspelled in this document as Protocha, but it's actually Trotoshaw, Trotoshaw, and it's to Bishop Berga to, for one dollar. And in the middle of this page, it's interesting to note that uh, both Jean Baptiste and his wife Sophia, who was a Native American, Jean Baptiste Trotoshaw was a French Canadian Catholic um, who married Sophia, and they settled in this area. and. In the middle of the page, you'll see his mark and her mark, obviously indicating they could neither need, uh, neither read nor write English. Uh, and also very interesting on this document is the bottom of the page shows that the transaction was notarized by Naeus Petasiga, Justice of the Peace, Chief Ignatius Petoski. Joe? This is uh, one of the great pictures that was uh, Lucy Trotajard um, had Daverney. This was in her personal effects in February 2006 and is assumed by a family to be Father Jean Baptiste and two of his descendants, probably two of his children. The interesting thing that Jeff didn't uh, touch on, I think he, is that uh, the, uh, Jean Baptiste Trotichard was the first white person in this area. It was always believed that uh, Porter uh, Reverend Porter it was the first here, but uh, Jean Baptiste Trotazard predates him by quite a few years, at least five to six years. So this is the uh, the picture of the Trotazard house in Duverney House. Um, the exact date of this photo is unknown, as it says. It was also found in the trunk belonging to Lisa, Lucy Trotazard Duverney, seated far right in February 2006. This would have been right down at the waterfront. In this, in this picture, you're, you'll see the family in front of the front door a little bit later on in the presentation, and we actually have a blow-up of that picture with, their, with who they are, which is pretty cool. Okay. So this is also another view of the, um, the, the cabin uh, of the Trotajards, and this is down by Magnus Park. And the neat thing about, the really good thing about this one is it shows so early on, this was before there was any white you know, settlers hardly in the area whatsoever. And they did some um, trading and they helped out with, you know, the Native Americans and what whites were traveling on the bay and stuff. They, they um, you know, they were like the, the first people there. So it's very interesting. So uh, Bishop, uh, this is a picture of Bishop Frederick Ber Berga um, who purchased the lands from the Trotoshots as we discussed. Uh, Trotoshaud was actually commissioned to actually build the church uh, in 1859, and as Joe, Joe pointed out, it was under the direction and supervision of uh, Father Sifreth from, here from Harbor Springs. This photo was taken in 1867, a year before his death, unfortunately. Um, going back to uh, the, what Joe had mentioned about uh, Andrew Porter, so there for, when I was growing up, there were, in Petoskey, there was uh, books that were written, uh, that were always said Andrew Porter was the first white person in the area. And uh, obviously we have documentation that Jean-Baptiste Trotichard who, uh, was here. He bought land in 1851, which is like five or six years before Andrew Porter. Um, and 
re one of the reasons that's to me it's very fascinating about why the church still exists is is it'll talk about a little bit more is there were like three or four attempts to build the church closer to the river um andrew porter and some of the other uh european american settlers burned the church down tore it down at least three times and finally um and it's detailed much more in detail in the book but uh there's in the book we actually have a letter from uh, porter writing a nasty letter about Berga and those darn catholics trying to settle in their area well the catholics were already here um obviously we have to just admit unfortunately there, there was catholic bias but there's also native american bias he was a you know french canadian catholic who married a native american woman which was probably let's face it it was controversial at that time trying to build a catholic church so in response to porter and the protestants trying to prevent the church being built um bishop Berga traveled to detroit to meet with the indian agent andrew fitch and actually negotiated to allow the church to be built so the, the he was in detroit so he had to get involved to allow the catholic community to build this church and the um the stipulation, of course, was obviously he had to buy it from Trotoshod for a dollar, made it into a personal private transaction instead of like the community allowing it. So there was actually a lot of uh, political intrigue that allowed this church to even be built, which is really important to manage, uh, to mention, excuse me. So this is the earliest known photo that we have. It's about circa 1890, and we can see the altar is still the same in the, in the cross and the crucifix. Uh, the organ, we don't know where that went to. The organ we have in the church right now is one that we purchased about uh, 2010, and we had it restored. It's a beautiful shot of the, of the church. And the communion rail is still there as well, so really would, um, you know, contact we worked, us. We'd love to show you the church in person if you haven't seen it. We worked, our committee worked about a week restoring on the communion rail because we thought it was so important to have the communion rail, the altar base, the altar, right where Bishop Berga had said mass. And we've had so many Slovenian priests and bishops and, and archbishops come throughout the years and say mass there because they want to stand where their fellow, uh, you know, Bishop Berga was from Slovenia, their fellow uh, you know, uh, they, you know, their 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 priest, their 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 bishop, and they love this bishop Erica. So, this is the earliest known photo that we have the exterior of the church. It's around 1884, which is coincides cr closely with when the Franciscans came to the area, and it is most likely um, because there's not any documentation as such, but a communion or confirmation service, or possibly both. Um, also important to notice that because of the amount of distance a lot of the priests, and especially when, before uh, Bishop Berga became a bishop, when he was Father Berga, they called him the snowshoe priest. He, they, I think they estimated he traveled over 10,000 miles on foot, going from the UP up to Marquette, Houghton, the UP, down to Grand Rapids to say Mass. So a lot of times they were saying Mass every three to six months in all these different churches. If you've ever had the opportunity to get through some of Bishop Berga's personal documentation and diary, he was an avid diarist. And one of the most fascinating stories that, that I read was his, uh, one of his Native American converts and himself and a uh, European lady teacher, they got in a canoe across Lake Michigan in February to go say mass in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It was Green Bay or somewhere, but it's across Lake Michigan. It was, in, anyways, there's some incredible stories with his, um, his mission to bring Catholicism. And honestly, because he was actually one of the first, first priests in this area, we all know from our history, there was a lot of French-Canadian uh, Jesuits up, and then they kind of disappeared for a while. But when uh, Father Berga came to the area, he was very, very successful converting uh, Native Americans to Catholicism, and a lot of it's because he lived with them. He wintered with them. He walked with them. He traveled with them. And 
and that's part of why there was a lot of resentment from, from the Protestant community because they, they lived in their houses and lived in the city and lived in the towns. And there, but like I said, Father Berigo was very successful, and, but he lived with them. He lived it. And he published many uh, books in their native languages. He learned their language, Bibles and, and, and it's, uh, academic books in the Native American languages. This is a wonderful photo that Jeff uh, pointed out was taken at that house. This is a blow up of the family. Sarah D uh, Duverney, John Henry's mother, Levi's mother, Louise, and you get the idea, it's the whole family living there early on in the 1850s. And it's a wonderful photo. This is also another uh, picture of the family. And it shows Lucy Trotajard Duverney, daughter of Jean Baptiste, and Sophie Trotajard and her family. And we, but we know that uh, Jean Baptiste, and as far as we know, I think Sophie, they are buried in the church yard. But we don't know where really much about the rest of the who's buried in the church yard. This photo is is became a very famous uh, postcard. And you can find it on eBay all the time. You can find it on Amazon. It's basically the church very, very early on with a building next to it that we don't know what they were doing in that building. There's now a house there if you've been down there. And this is from the waterfront. A lot of people ask us if we turned the church, and we haven't. Because when Bishop Berga came there, he came across by water and any... The, the white settlers of the area and the Native Americans all came mostly by canoe or some other way. There was no Lake Street in back of it. So that, that's, why, that's why the cemetery is in back of the church, back by the... Uh, by the street. By the street. And the crosses that are there are, are just... Uh, they're about the fifth set that we know of, and it just kind of marks the graves there. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of graves there, and we've done ground penetrating radar. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if you can see how worked up the ground is, there's about five layers of dirt. We had an archaeologist from the state of Michigan come, and we dug down, and he showed us the different layering um, over the years. Um, yeah, like in the 1930s, uh, during the one renovation, the Knights of Columbus hauled in dirt to raise the, the grounds up and make it nicer. And then we hauled in about six <clears throat> inches of dirt and put more dirt over. And, and actually, it's kind of helped out with protecting the burials, too, getting more, you know, them deeper and more dirt and, and getting it all in a good shape. So, and Another interesting thing to point out about this uh, photo, if you look down on the lower right, you'll see the back half of a horse <laughs> standing next to the church yeah right down there next to that little fence you see not too far from the front door the the, yeah, yeah yep in the black and white horse. and um also at some point around when the church was no longer in use and i think the franciscan and saint francis xavier was built the, the church kind of fell in and out of use at certain times and um there was a i think a document a story that the then sheriff of uh, Petoskey actually was renting it out like as a fishing shack and doing certain things because that uh, anyway so it fell out of use from the St. Francis Xavier um, but then again came back into use with certain uh, renovations the, and restorations. Uh, the pastor up at the, past, the pastor at St. Francis didn't realize that this guy was storing fish nets in there and the uh, yeah, and it, you know, it was back in the day, and so then he had them booted out of there. <laughs> okay, so this photo is a picture of them of the 1931, and it shows the local Odawa tribe members uh, working on the church. And the tribe actually has identified, I believe, everyone in that photo, as far as they could tell. They blew them up and they had people look at these and they identified everybody in the church. You see the train tracks in front yeah. of the church? The train, you know, it is that, the train was that close to the building. And then Father Albert, Albert Keiter, pastor of St. Francis uh, Parish, he oversaw this renovation. Good. Um, this is kind of one of my favorite photos because it 
really shows how um, out of disrepair the church was just before 1931. And this is putting a new uh, roof, of course, on the church. And you can see the uh, original uh, shutters on there, which we still have. And um, we don't really know what this wood object in the right-hand corner is. And the cross isn't there that's there right now that shows up in 1959. And you'll notice also that a lot of the, the uh, crosses are gone, too. So... So this is the, the celebration of the 1931 restoration. And you know, the train in the background during the celebration going that close to the church. And uh, they're obviously we're transporting people and freight from the cities as far south as Chicago. We know that's how a lot of people traveled up to Bayview, et cetera, in our area. And all the way up to the Straits of Mackinac. Okay, so this, so this was uh, with Father Kiter. And this was at Lake Street, in, you know, in the back of the church there. And it was a 90 degree day, I'm, to I'm, I'm told. And uh, Native Americans and the, uh, the different, all the different people dressed in their uniforms. And it was just a sweltering day. But you can notice how wonderful the cemeteries fixed up and everything. And they, they did a lot of work on the building to keep it up. It was a good thing because it actually helped it stay standing. Good. And this is a postcard. Um, it kind of shows the, the fence that was there and uh, the wreath on the cross, which the Native Americans did uh, up till the COVID. Uh, we always had uh, a wreath up there to remind us of the dead. And uh, the church was pretty much, that was the year that we, we chose for our renovation. Um, when you do a restoration, I, I hate the word renovation. When you do a restoration and you wanna do a true restoration of a, of a, of a building, you wanna pick a year and we couldn't go back to the original, hardly 1930 restoration or renovation was right where we wanted to be because that was the closest to what the church was currently. And so that's uh, kind of the date, uh, what we, we chose. And unfortunately, uh, noted in the picture, in the 40s it fell back into some pretty serious disrepair. So um, this is obviously dated from the New Northern Michigan Review, August 24, 1944. Uh, again, the shutters are still there, and, and um, there might have been a couple of tweaks to the shutters, but again, what a miracle that uh, you know, the, the church really hadn't been vandalized, and it's still standing and completely restored today. Um, the sign on the side of the building uh, was still later in the presentation, but uh, we still have that sign. It's been moved to the to the fence area by the street. But again, falling back into disrepair, like I said, and disrepair in the 40s, the fence is falling down, and um, I don't think there's documentation of any masses being said then either. Back to that photo of the big uh, celebration for First Communion, or you know, where the, they were having the big, what happens is um, my ancestors would have come in 1877 with all the influx of all the whites coming to Petoskey. And so they worshiped at St. Francis Slanus and it got so overcrowded because you know that church holds about 60 people on a, if you're really crowded in there and they were getting huge Sunday masses. And so the Native Americans and the white settlers mutually agreed to go up on the top of the hill and build St. Francis Xavier Church. So the, the, the church was in use for about three years simultaneously while they were building the one. It, it's not the St. Francis Xavier Church you think of today. It was another one, another church that no longer exists got tore down. But they were using both churches. And right after that, the Franciscans came in late 1884, really 1885, and they renamed this church. They, did, they wanted it to be named after St. Francis Slanus, the, you know, the South American missionary. missionary priest that was just named a saint. And, and the Franciscans were renaming every church for it. They were just, they were just throwing it. St. Francis Slanus at Bayshore, um, everywhere. They, you know, everywhere. So 
unfortunately, it's got, it, it had its name changed. And the name that I, that it was before was really beautiful. And I think Michelle might be the only one out there that knows it. And Father might know it. What was the name of the church before the Franciscan came, came and renamed it? Okay. So picture Father Baraga. Picture Father Baraga. And he's in his canoe and he's over here at Holy Childhood. And he says, and he said, I'm going to go over to Agami in his diary. And Agami means across the water and on the shore. So picture Berga in on glass like water, hopefully not <laughs> three feet waves and getting thrown all around. He might have been. But anyway, picture him paddling over to say mass or to go over there to see how the church is coming because in his in 1859 he writes in his diary i'm going to agami i've got to get protojar nails he had to take them nails for the church so bishop Berga named really named it agami Ag 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 agami which is across the water so so the franciscans renamed it and they renamed you know saint francis xavier that was um, St. Paul's Church, and then, the, of course, the school was St. Joseph's. It never was St. Francis Xavier until the Franciscans came, and they named it for Jesuits. Nobody, nobody can figure that one out either. Of course, your church here was St. Peter's, right? And then it got renamed. 1851. Yeah, and then they got renamed, too. So, anyway, that's... So this is just prior to the 1959 centennial, 100 years, centennial restoration, renovation. And Father Lauren Buzinski from St. Francis Xavier is standing next to the base. It was built for the statue of the missionary. Now, it's, during the last restoration, it was actually moved up closer to the front yard. But it was behind the church for many, many years. And, but unfortunately, um, who could, she couldn't be with us tonight, but Mary Jo Parker, her, her family actually uh, donated the, the uh, Franciscan and Native American marble statue that's there, just didn't make it in time for the celebration. They had the base, and they were celebrating the base, but they didn't, unfortunately, it didn't come until after the celebration. A local, a local, a local Catholic uh, had done the base. He was a master cement uh, rock person. And so he built the base, and then a week later, Lucille Parker's wonderful Caesarian marble statue of two Native Americans praying with a priest comes a week after the big celebration. And, uh, this is a celebration. So this is also part of the centennial. This is also part of the centennial rites in September fifth, eighteen fifty nine, and. I'm, I'm try, I was trying and trying to find in the photo. We have another photo. These are the Ottawas and Chippewa Indians. Brave temperatures in the mid-90s Sunday afternoon in their heavy native attire to form a guard of honor. For His Excellency, Most Reverend Alan J. Babcock, Bishop of the Grand Rapids Diocese Center and Very Reverend Pius Barth, Minister Provincial of the Sacred heart providence so they had some big shooters there what's not shown in this picture and we've got a picture of it, it's not in the book is when they had the um the garage sale i'll call it, here at holy childhood at the school there were their boy red and white cast i would call it would cast what surplus or for the older boys? Okay. Anyway, they, they had a bunch of them on sale over here. And we had a family that was involved in the re restoration. They picked some of them up because those are in this photo. Those special, they were a special outfit for the older boys. And the older boys wore it to this, this event. So this is the sign that I mentioned earlier that we... Fortunately, we still have it. It's, you know, I don't think anybody really knows when it was first made and put on the church, but um, it's pretty cool that it's still there. We still have it. It wasn't stolen. Again, just, it, it stuns me to think that this 
this church, which is still authentic and mostly intact, you know, wasn't vandalized. We still have the original windows, never broken a window. Um, it's, it's very, what a blessing, you know. So in 2005, when we started to do the restoration, the church was in, in really, um, it needed a lot of repair to the, the foundation and to the roof and to the structure. To do that, we had to lift the church in the air and we wanted to make sure that we knew where the burials were. And at that time, this was a ground penetrating radar that was done and it showed burials right at the church foundation as you're looking at the one, uh, see how are I equated? Maybe to the west? The, to, to the, the west. The west, okay. You see those, those little arrows right along the wall? Of, it says St. Francis Solano Church right there and then on the side. Anyway, those are the, all those little marks represented burials. So when we did this, we had to have, um, we had the tribe there and their, their um, Stadium, Michigan, and Federal. we did the, all, any of the digging, we, 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 uh, we did it all with sifting and looking and anything that we found was you know, reburied properly with the tribe. And so it was just part of what we had to do. Nowadays, that's 2005, they have a lot better radar. And I think it would be kind of interesting to see what would, but it doesn't really matter because we know there's burials there. There's, you know, it's, uh, it's what, what is there. Okay, this is the way we found the church in 2005. And you can see the statue. Um, of the two Indians and in the, in the uh, Saint France, uh, the Franciscan missionary, praying there in front, and the trees. See how overgrown it was, and we can see the shutters are still there. But the the church really was in tough shape. Um, it needed so much work. The foundation was so bad, and just the whole church was six inches out. We had cabled. It was kind of cabled together, but it was six inches out. And at the was, top. Mm -hmm. In the right. next photo, it shows the post. There were actually we had to put posts in to keep it from collapsing in the in the uh, church itself. And you and you'll notice that this is in 2005, and um, you see the communion rail, uh, the altar, still the original altar. There is a confessional uh, on the side. Nobody knows really when it showed up, and, but that wasn't authentic to the pictures shown in uh, the 30s so it was removed because that's the time frame that the committee chose to really try to restore to um, but we're uh, the, the photos uh, the blessed heart the crucifix it's all there it's original it's authentic it's from the original church so some of the stuff in the church is kind of left over from saint francis xavier maybe from even over here we don't know Correct. so when when we started the restoration we knew that we had to lift the church and we had to put a foundation under it and we spent a lot of time uh, we had the knights of columbus helping we had a lot of volunteers like you can't believe and we did the foundation so it looked and somewhat was really as close to original yet functional as we could and uh, I didn't see it personally, but I've had lots of people who were there tell me that when they lifted the church, there were big tree stumps that had been cut off, and that's what the church was resting on. That was part of the foundation, was big tree stumps in the middle, keeping the place from sagging and collapsing. And uh, you'll see the crucifixes over there that we have on the table. Um, as much of the beams and woodwork that had to be removed, we saved that. And some of the volunteers from the committee made those crosses are from the church. They're from the beams from underneath the foundation. So um, it's pretty cool that, um, but when you go into the church, when you come in there, we actually have some pieces of the original beam they had to take out. So, I mean, it's just, it's the history of it's pretty stunning. But like I said, there's big tree stumps right underneath the church that was holding the church up. So. Well, uh, what they were were cedar. There were cedar stumps, and they weren't really holding the church up that much, <laughs> but there were cedar stumps underneath it just cut off. And it was a big round, and we left it. We left all this there. It was a big round, almost like a ship's mask, 
that was running, not doing anything functional, just underneath the church. But we do also believe that a lot of the, the wood that was used in that church was repurposed from somewhere else. We kind of think maybe Bishop Verga found it like in Traverse City and it was brought there by ship or, or Chicago. So some of the wood was repurposed. This is the original bell and is dated 1886. There, there was a bell, believe it or not, before that, but we don't have that bell. So we call this the original bell because it's the only bell that we know of. And we restored it, we rest and uh, we took down the whole, the whole bell tower came off. Uh, we lifted the church with the, do we have a photo of the church again? There you go. So when we were doing the rent restoration, we lifted the church and there was about five of us underneath the church and I think one of them might have been uh, Michelle LeCount's uh, dad, Don Portman, and we were under it and we were looking at the bell tower and that big, and that big heavy bell up there and we all of a sudden said, we've got to take that top bell tower and get the bell out of there and when we took it all off, there's just a couple rusty nails holding that bell and all that bell tower up there. We were really lucky. So this is uh, what the building looked like uh, after we took the siding off. And we, uh, um, I found some uh, authentic hemlock beams that would have been to the period of that. They were 130 years old. And we took them and we had them specially sawn and we used them for sill beams, which those crosses are made of the sill beams, which as near as we could tell, they were, um, they were a beech tree hand hewn beams. And then we, in the winter, we worked inside the church on all the siding and we fixed every board and we put it all back. Board, just like you see on this old house, we took and repaired every board. No matter how bad a board it was, we fixed it. Go ahead. Okay, so this is an attic fire that uh, we, we didn't understand. Um, when, when you go up into the attic, which you can see the little um, trap door, there's a white little door right there at the bottom. And I could not get through there without taking my coat off and just barely get up in there to work. I'm a little bit, you know, on the heavy side here. So, but anyway, up in there, the church is just burnt. And I, could, I couldn't figure out how they would have gotten the fire out. Because if you can't get, you'd have to have a ladder. First thing, you gotta have a ladder. And this is inside the church. So about, about three years ago, I'm reading through newspapers and I found the, the reason. About 1914, some, some, uh, a house next door noticed the church, uh, I mean, their house was on fire. And so they, got, they had the fire department come and this was a couple, a little, pretty close, and the church pretty, and the house pretty much burned. But they noticed smoke coming out of the, the church. The roof had caught on fire, so the fire department all came, and they were able to get the, the fire out. So that's kind of interesting. So during the last restoration, um, the old plaster was removed and replaced, but all the original lath, original lath was left in place and just replastered and reused. And you can see that. You can see that on this here when they took the siding off. You can see that it was still was able to leave it in place. So, so we happen to be really lucky that the last person in this area that knew how to do real plaster, Harold Baird. Some of you might have remembered Harold Baird, maybe not here. He lived in Batoski on um, Epler Road, and he had learned it from his dad, who did all the houses in Batoski in this area in the 40s and 50s. He took over the business and he, he was right at the end of retiring. And I talked him into putting real plaster on. And uh, my, you know, it, it just, it turned out so good because we wanted to have it authentic and to have somebody that was a master craftsman that would oversee putting real plaster back was, was just, it was very good. Okay, so these are Stations of the Cross, 
And they're still there. They're still, they are there now, and they're not the first ones. They're not the first ones. Like I said, a lot of stuff has happened, but they are the best ones. And there's a reason. And I know you guys can keep a secret, right? <laughs> Born to secret. Secret. Okay. So what they are is we took them, we took them all apart and cleaned them and, re and we, we fixed uh, some of the frames and stuff. And they date back to the 1880s. And they are in three languages, Latin, French, and English. What they are is they're courier and I've Courier knives, and they're from actually from Paris, is what we're told, and they're really quite expensive. They're very, very rare. And this is Bishop Captain saying mass with uh, the Native American drummers, the, the women drummers. They are wonderful. If you ever get to hear them, they are the best. So this one on May 12, 2000, uh, 2015, after more than five years of effort by the committee. Um, St. Francis Solanus finally received the State of Michigan Historical Marker. And we worked for many years with uh, the uh, Odawas, Odawa tribe and their historians uh, to try to come up with proper language um, for both English and in Odawa. And uh, the church is, you know, it's listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so it's really kind of cool to go down and actually see it. And there's a lot of, again, so much collaboration that this could not have happened without, you know, the, the collaboration of all those entities. And um, the really cool thing is when this is, so this is in the yard, side yard. When this was being dug, um, the tribe's res representative for historical burial, I think that's the right term, was there because we had to make sure when the posts were being dug that we weren't disturbing a grave. And actually so very carefully was digging the hole in the post and oops signs of a grave so it was actually moved three times three different locations before um it was decided that it was not disturbing any of the native american graves that are on site okay so this is a picture of the way it looks right now the church is truly a spiritual place especially for me and when I think about, you know, how many great, I'll call them, uh, you know, bishops, priests, lay people, um, you know, that have worshiped there and the Native American burial ground, just everything it is just a, a serious, special place. One of the things we have to remember is that when, when the Catholic faith came to town, uh, the natives were very interested in it. And you find that there's a lot of similarities when the stories and, of, and you attend Native uh, talking circles and you listen to your elders and the stories that have been passed down for generations. And one of the classic examples I like to give is the story of uh, Nanabuju who walked the earth for the creator. And that's a story that was passed down about a great flood. And of course, we are alerted to that similarity with uh, the Great Flood and the saving of the animals, which is the same story of Nanabuju and the saving of the animals and mankind uh, through um, the animals gathering around him and, and trying to figure out what to do with all this water coming on. And when it got too deep, a uh, turtle came and put everybody on his back which is where you may have heard the reference of Turtle Island being the land that we live on now. And so Turtle put everybody on their back, the great turtle, and they floated for a long time and tried to find land. And Nanabuju asked a couple of the other animals, you know, can you, can you go down and see if you can find, the, find land? And some of the animals didn't make it back and sacrificed on behalf uh, to, of you know, of everyone to find land. And finally Muskrat came back because he was the best swimmer and he could hold his water, uh, his air, the longest underwater. And he came back with a little fistful of dirt and they gave everybody hope. And they laid the dirt on Turtle's back and then the land came back. So it's a very similar story to uh, our great flood that we teach. And so in that respect, a lot of natives, what I hear, um, appreciated the same t uh, style and the same familiarities and the teachings. Um, 
and everything from what i understand and listening to history um i have a tribal historic preservation officer in my office she works closely with digs and and all of that and she brings back a lot of stories from a lot of her elders that she meets along the way too and one of the things we find is is when i'm putting all the pieces together is when at what point dissension came in and why there was so much strife uh between the native americans and the and the catholics and when you look at the history of it it all goes back to um the the when the united states came to play uh came to be and the indian removal act was instilled uh to um put natives on reservations and keep them in their place and the government had realized that the church had a really good uh, camaraderie with the Native Americans already. So they asked the church to step in and to help them to uh, do this. In the Indian Removal Act, it was, and the church thought they were doing a good thing. Um, in the Indian Removal Act, they asked for uh, the children to be educated, the Native children to be educated, and the, and the federal government decided that was their responsibility, which is why the boarding schools happened. So we know the history and what we see in the news and, you know, and all of that with the boarding schools. Um, my father was uh, an individual very, very much in his uh, faith um, to bring harmony to the tribe and to the Catholic Church. He worked hard with the bishop. Um, he came into my office one day and he sat down because I work in the, I'm the legislative branch manager for the tribal government here in the Odawas. And he came into my office one day and he sat down and he says, I need money. And I thought, my dad needs money. You know, what do you need money for, dad? Okay. <laughs> and he said, no, I need, you know, money to restore the, uh, and uh, so I said, okay, I'll get you that. So I wrote a resolution and we gave the seed money to start that out at $5,000. And uh, so then he, you know, for, after that was done, um, my father passed in February of 2018. He was on the committee and I wasn't. And uh, he passed in 2018 in February and the dedication for, the, for this little church was in July of 2000, or 2008, I'm sorry, in 2008. Um, so my dad missed it, but we know he was there. Um, and automatically I assumed I had to be on the committee <laughs> in his place. Uh, so he's worked, he worked very hard. Um, Prior to his passing, uh, he organized the, um, uh, when the church decided they were going to uh, demolish the boarding school that sat on these grounds. My dad attended the boarding school when he was a child. Um, he was uh, placed by uh, there in the 1940s, um, early, mid 1940s. Um, he appreciated the faith, uh, the attention. He had a home. Uh, this was his home, my father's home. Um, he had no animosity towards it at all. Um, it was his family, and uh, he got more love and attention and nourishment than he got anywhere else. And so when the church was decommissioning the boarding school, he wanted it to go down in a good way. So he organized the closing ceremony that uh, Holy Childhood had and brought in people from all over the country to do, to do that. And we had the traditional drum and ceremony. And... Um, one of the things he wanted was, he was always the child that was left in the summer with no parents to come and get him. And everybody got to go home but him. And he was here for two years like that. And the door he sat at the, was very important, the steps he sat on was very important because he waited for someone to come and get him and they never did. And the, re, uh, the door that you see that was restored and placed on this building is that door. And the bishop uh, granted that uh, for my father. So it, it means a lot. And the little uh, historic heritage room that is in the building also, um, he asked for. Uh, he asked for that as part of a remembrance um, in a good way, uh, something he wanted. And that was granted also. So uh, Donald Portman. Yep. Senior. And, uh, Yep, senior. <laughs> I have a brother. <laughs> um, so he, he was very uh, quiet. Nobody really knew him. Uh, but when he needed something done, he just kind of went and did it and, and got it taken care of, you know. 
So I appreciate everyone being here tonight and listening to that story. It means a lot to me to share my dad's journey. So, so Michelle's dad really was a really good guy, good friend. Driving force for He was, he was. But there, there's one more thing, and then I'll leave, maybe we'll just leave this, is, you know, Bishop Berga, he truly united uh, people, and he was more, more of a, you know, looking out for the needs of both whites and Native Americans as far as their their spiritual need, but also their need for food, clothing, and that. And he really went to bat against the U.S. government a lot of times when they did they, they didn't give what they were supposed to give, you know, get. And he got in trouble for it. And I mean, he got he took some grief, but he, I don't think he cared, you know. But the other thing that was really a shining kind of star was over at Charlevoix, there's um, the Green Sky Church, Peter Green Sky with the was a Chippewa Methodist minister, and he was a, he comes on the scene over there about the same time as Bishop Berga, and he builds his church over there, and him and Berga became pretty good friends because even though he was a Methodist minister, he was and he was Chippewa, and Bishop Berga knew the Chippewa language too. Uh, they were on the same plane, the same mission. They were looking out for people and, and trying to do the right thing. And so there, there was different time frames throughout history where things weren't so good, and then they were good, and I hope that things get better. So we're just, that's it. The, in uh, kind of jumping on what both Michelle and uh, Joe had talked about is to really understand Bishop Berga and his impact when he, he ended up going to Europe multiple times to back to his home base in Slovenia, twisting arms for money to come back to the United States and print Native American, again, academic books, Bibles. And so he not only lived with them, and you know, my take on doing, just reading about the contention, anti-Catholicism and, and that, that strife to try to get the church built, um, he, when he was a snowshoe priest, lived with them. He wintered with them. He stayed in their camps, migrated with them, and then, of course, traveled to all these other camps. And the Protestants built their homes in town. They wanted the natives to come to them. Bishop Berga, Father Berga, went to them. Speaks volumes. You know, and he's responsible, I think, for literally hundreds of, out of his own pocket and his supporters in Europe, the, the, all of the, again, the, the language translation books and academic Bibles, etc. So that's why he was so successful, and that's why I think there was such an amazing relationship and why he had such a huge impact.